OCO, my name is Dallas Pettigrew. I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. Every day is a good day. Chief Woman Killer used to say that. Today's a really good day to be alive and to be native. In fact, this might be the best time in the last 500 years to be native. Tribal nations are exercising sovereignty and self-determination as they grow their businesses and educate their people to improve their health and their quality of life. As a tribal member, I know firsthand the many strengths of native people. In fact, we're the grandchildren of the strongest people who've ever lived. We come from people who have endured disease and warfare, force relocation, all kinds of human rights violations for more than 500 years. And we're here because those who came before us were resilient. We've inherited that resilience. Sadly, many of us have inherited trauma too. Trauma is sometimes passed from generation to generation. I once heard that the original gateway drug is trauma. Once that gateway is opened, it becomes easier for other problems to go through that same gate and cause more problems for Native people. Problems like substance misuse, addiction, overdose, and many other health problems and social problems come along too. Problems like family dysfunction, mental health concerns, physical health concerns, diseases, and all too often, early death. But just as trauma can pass from generation to generation, so can healing. There are many strategies Native communities have used to restore hope and health to their people. Scientists working with other communities of people have created and tested many strategies to prevent substance abuse disorder among young people. It's important that these strategies are tested to make sure they work. We don't want to waste anyone's time or effort or money doing things that don't work. With that said, many of these newly created interventions were not created by Native people, not explicitly for Native people, and were not tested in Native communities. However, things are changing. In recent years, prevention scientists and Native tribes have partnered together to adapt strategies, incorporate tribal culture, test interventions in Native communities, and then share those results with Native and non-Native decision makers so that any resources dedicated to preventing these problems are dedicated to the interventions that are most likely to work. One major challenge though, is the lack of native people working in the field of prevention science. There are many good people out there trying to recruit native young people into the field. So hopefully they can return to their communities where they are known and trusted, where they can implement interventions themselves and where they can add to the strength and resilience of their own communities. Today, I'm representing a group of scientists and practitioners who received funding from the National Institutes of Health through an initiative known as HEAL, H-E-A-L, which stands for Helping to End Addiction Long-Term. The National Institutes of Health received special funding from Congress to address the opioid epidemic with strong science to find solutions. Specifically, we're part of a group funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to develop and test strategies to prevent opioid and other substance abuse disorders among older adolescents and young adults. In a few minutes, you'll get to listen as three Native people discuss prevention science from an academic perspective and from a direct service perspective. They represent both urban and reservation settings and will share about how they found themselves in this work in the first place. Emory University undergraduate student and a tribal member, Sierra Talavera Brown, introduces us to Julie Skinner and Daniel Dickerson. Yaate, my name is Sierra Talavera Brown, and I'm a senior at Emory College of Arts and Sciences, pursuing a degree in human biology and anthropology. I am Dene, born for Meadow people, um, and a member of the Navajo Nation. My interests are grounded in non Western and indigenous healing systems, and I intend to pursue a degree in osteopathic medicine with a focus on integrative medicine. I'm an undergraduate research assistant with Emory's Prevention Research Center at Rollins School of Public Health, and I'm currently working on a project with the Cherokee Nation. I have made extensive contributions to the Emory community through my role in the Native American Student Initiative, and I'm also the president of Emory's first Native American Student Association. I also serve as the Osteopathic and Integrative Medicine Chair in Emory's Pre-Medical Association. I am grateful to have the opportunity to speak to Dr. Daniel Dickerson and Senior Director of Behavioral Health of the Cherokee Nation, Julie Skinner.
Uvanga Uniarag, Sigavan Koya, Miyagwa Wainwright, and Dan Dickerson. I'm a Nupiak on my mother's side and Caucasian Western European on my father's side. I'm an addiction psychiatrist and an associate research psychiatrist at UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. Hi, my name is Julie Skinner. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Behavioral Health here at Cherokee Nation. I've been working within the Cherokee Nation for the past 22 years. Uh, I am originally from Ponca City, Oklahoma. I am a member of the Ponca tribe and um, I was very, very close to my culture. I was raised um, in a very traditionally, uh, uh, very, I'm not sure what I want to say about that, but anyway, uh, I uh, we have been working with the Cherokee Nation um, in the since 2000. In the beginning, I received my bachelor's in psychology, and when I knew I wanted to work within uh, with children and families um, involved uh, within systems, and so I wasn't really sure what that looked like until I really came and, and graduated with my bachelor's degree in psychology, trying to understand where I wanted to start my work. Um, I started working in child welfare at Cherokee Nation and quickly learned uh, the hardships and the challenges um, that the system puts in, um, in front of people who are struggling with addiction, with parenting, uh, with, you know, they have a lot of challenges. And so I realized quickly that the systems that are here to help our tribal families were not working very well. Uh, so after several years of working in Indian child welfare, I went back to school and received my master's in social work. And I learned a lot. I realized um, the type of role I wanted to play at that point was to build programs and systems that actually will be helpful to our Cherokee families um, and children. Uh, so we encounter a lot of challenges every day, but we have to have some programs in place that are actually going to be helpful for our families. And so my work is more of a macro level. I get to develop programs, design uh, interventions, and do different services across our Cherokee Nation reservation. And that was where I started to really go into uh, behavioral health. And so really I realizing early on the, the mental health aspect of, of the work we do is really very limited in, in, in what we were able to do in child welfare. I really wanted to emphasize um, these programs early on, um, starting with the zero to three population. So we built a lot of programs and developed um, our HERO project. And so the HERO project was our children's services that really worked within the communities. It worked directly with families and children, and it worked on the policy level as well, partnering with states and other um, national organizations to help bring forth more interventions, more interventions that were gonna be more effective with our children and families. So just a little bit about what I do, uh, and I continue to do that work today. We've expanded behavioral health rapidly within the Cherokee Nation. Uh, we were much smaller several years ago, and now we've adding new service lines every day, it seems like, uh, but we're adding more services regarding substance use, uh, really working within communities to help them develop supports for their own communities because we know our families know ourselves. We know that they, our families and our communities know themselves way uh, better than we know them. So it's really important that we emphasize that their strengths of what they know and that they're the experts in their own families. And so that's one, one thing we really work to is pull the strengths of our families to help develop and design these interventions. So that's just a little bit about me. Great. You've um, touched on a lot of uh, amazing points that we will definitely circle back to during our conversation. Um, I wanted to start this conversation by exploring your career paths, as many of our listeners like myself are in the beginning of our journeys. Um, and I was wondering if you guys could speak to how you initially became interested in your field um, and how your background contributed to your interests. I know, Julie, you touched on that a little bit, but. Yes, I, um, well, I was quote unquote a non-traditional student. I started later on in my mid twenties in my, in my undergraduate graduate work. and. Um, I first became interested in mental health as a pre, pre-medical student, pre-med student. Uh, when I attended the Association of American Indian Physicians annual conference, that was really a big eye-opener in, in learning more about Indian health care needs, um, mental health, um, really being able to be mentored for the first time or really have the opportunity to um, see other Native American physicians and, and leaders in the field. That was really awesome. And uh, I, I was able to meet Dr. Dale Walker and other psychiatrists who um, 
really first uh, introduced me to the field of mental health. And um, from there, I, I did some clinical rotations in medical school and psychiatry. Uh, and I really that really sold the deal, so to speak. Um, I really enjoyed helping people in, in the hospital setting, uh, individuals who are experiencing um, depression and psychiatric disorders. And also I was able to understand or begin to understand the impact of substance use on, on mental health um, uh, conditions. Um, yeah, so that's um, how I first started in becoming first interested in, in the mental health field and substance use fields. So for me, it started back, um, I think I got inspired um, really early on, um, in the beginning when I was first born, I had a, a two parents who were not able to take care of me. They're both uh, abused substances and were alcoholics. And um, my sister and I were placed in the foster care system. And so I was very lucky. Um, there was a law called the Indian Trouble for Act that was passed in 1978 that really allowed um, family members um, from my own tribe um, to come forward and adopt my sister and I. Because before then I was in, we, we were in several different foster homes and non-native foster homes at that. So came really close to being adopted out, but luckily um, because of this law, I was able to uh, be adopted by a, a, a paternal uh, member of my family. So anyway, my sister and I were um, raised um, in our home and we had our language spoken every day and we were very, very lucky. So that really inspired me to really do something about, you know, the chant that I received. My sister and I were both very, very lucky. And so how do we pass that on? How do you, you know, move, you know, pass that forward? And so my mother um, who adopted us, she was a social worker, still a social worker. I think once you're, you're, you become a social worker, you're always a social worker, no matter what you do. And so she inspired me um, to go into the field because uh, of the work that she did as a social worker. She created programs for homeless people for um, people who were disadvantaged. She did a lot of work in her own community. So that really inspired me to go into social work. I just wasn't sure what area and what field until I went into child welfare and really got inspired to understanding because of the personal connection I had to the child welfare system as well. So um, moving from that point forward, just really becoming passionate. I think this job and, and the work that we do, you're going to have some really hard days really hard days and it's not going to go your way and you're going to wonder why and I think connecting back to why you do what you do helps you get through those hard days so that really helped me um, get through these days that we have that are constantly challenging that we have from every day because our people are using substances to cope um, we have a lot of depression anxiety from the multi the multi-generational trauma that has gone on historical trauma that is a real thing and we see it every day we see it played out every day and so in this field it's important to have that passion and have a way, which way you are inspired. I definitely, it's, I don't regret a day of the work I do. That's for one, one thing for sure. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, I agree in that our lived experiences, families and community really shape our passions and are at the basis of our um, wills to pursue careers in public health and medicine. Um, that being said, our communities face staggering structural and health um, inequities. So I was wondering if you guys could speak um, on some of the unique challenges that you have noticed Native people face entering the um, public health and medicine fields um, today and how you face these challenges or advice on how to overcome. Yes, I, I grew up in and still work in L.A. County. So I grew up in Long Beach, California. It's in Los Angeles County. I live in the area today. And um, growing up in the urban areas has really um, motivated me as, as I began my, my journey in, 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 uh, as a psychiatrist and addiction psychiatrist to start to look at some of the com complexities of health care. And mental health care in the urban areas, which is very, very um, under-recognized the needs of Native uh, American individuals who live in, in the big cities of the U.S., where 70% where of Native um, people now live. And, and of course, there's huge needs um, 
and under um, funded programs and, and needs in, in the rural reservation rancherias villages of the US. But there's also needs within the urban areas and a lot of inequities. And I think some of the barriers to um, receiving adequate mental health and general health care in general is the and, you know, first of all, we're a small population in the big cities, we could be, you know, one, two percent, you know, the population. So often we're not seen. Um, there's a lack of understanding of, uh, in general, of Native Americans were often uh, either over glamorized, cart you know, like cartoon, uh, um, kind of uh, cartoonish, you know, people or were were looked upon as people who have who are have issues with substance use, but we're not looked upon as real people oftentimes. And I think that is one of the effects of historical traumas and many microaggressions that our, our people face. So um, one of my passions is try is in trying to educate the field, other healthcare providers, community members, and policymakers of who the real people are in, 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 in 2022 <laughs> um, and who, um, who and how we can as native professionals and researchers help to uh, fill the gaps of, of treatment and prevention needs. So from where I'm at, we're in rural Oklahoma, we have a lot of different tribes that were displaced um, from their homelands and moved to Oklahoma. And so we have a 39 tribes currently right now in Oklahoma that are um, throughout the state. And so we have a lot of pockets and it looks like a, a checkerboard. You have reservation land here, reservation land there. Growing up, that's what it looked like. And I know there's been some recent um, huge uh, court uh, decisions that have changed that. And so it's more continuous now. Uh, but before then, um, we were really... Uh, it was, there's a lot of gaps in services. And so there's still gaps in services, especially in rural uh, areas within Oklahoma. So the inequities really start to show up um, pretty early on within the school systems. We have small rural school districts that don't get a lot of funding. And a lot of these school districts are in our, in our areas where a lot of tribal uh, children go to school and, and there's just a lot of lack of resources um, early on in, in the work that we did with our children's services. When we were working with these small rural schools, they didn't have, money for supplies they didn't have money for um for food really it was just you know children really uh kind of lagged behind in some of these schools because it's the lack of resources and it in when you are really young and you are not having a lot of resources that's really going to impact how you are and how you grow and how you're impacted as you grow um, and so what we do uh is to really work with these schools to increase resources, increase their knowledge, um, areas we, we actually partner with schools to write grants um, to provide mental health services for some of these school districts, um, just because the need is so great in these, these small rural areas. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of lack of infrastructure. A lot of times um, in a lot of our communities, there's not a high skilled jobs. There's a lot of unskilled labor jobs that are around um, where you can go and you don't really need a higher education and it's it shows and so families a lot of times will feel stuck um, because they have their families there and they need help with child care and it's really hard to move out of their communities because of the need of, of having needing families like almost you have to choose between your family and culture versus you know making a higher pay and so a lot of times our families are, are have a, a hard decision to make and um, we'll have to sacrifice things um, for that. And so you see that um, as as youth get older and then as you know become adults, uh, you see a lot of hopelessness um, and depression resulting from they feel that they're unable to move or, or stuck in the situation that they're in, especially with um, substance use. We have families who um, are have multiple generations who have used substances to cope and to get through every day, and they don't know any other way. Um, and so they're, they 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 get into that mindset that I can't make it out of this. My family didn't, I don't know anyone who really does. So I'm gonna continue what I already know. So you see a lot of that um, within our systems. So being that our, a lot of our these systems in place are disconnected and decontextualized, um, 
how does focusing on community engagement and partnership kind of um, reform the disconnect, if that makes sense? So like, can you guys speak to the importance of community engagement and your work being guided by your tribal communities, their needs and perspectives? Yes, in the work that I've done, and uh, both in research and in, in clinical practice, we understand and we know that the knowledge of our of our traditional ways of healing, our health, our 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 um, the ways that we look at of living a, a life in balance and balance and wellness really lies in our our traditions and are really the knowledge is really held with our elders and communities uh, they're not typically in textbooks or on websites um, they're kind of carried in traditions and songs um, and, and traditional practices so the answers we believe in our work are, are are in the community so we go to the community we we access their knowledge we access their perspectives um, and, and their advice on how, how we can integrate and better contextualize our treatment approaches. So yes, evidence-based practices do exist that are, that are made for the general population at, at large, and some could be a benefit for Native people, and there's you know, a lot of good medications, et cetera, in Western healthcare. But to complete the picture and better integrate um, our approach, it's the missing link, so to speak, would be the cultural um, connectedness and, and the, the, the knowledge of our, of our people and, and traditions. So um, that's what's really great about working in the research field is that we have that opportunity to um, discuss these uh, matters with our community and to gain their perspective in a appropriate way without um, without um, um, in a respectful manner. So we're able to uh, not exploit our culture, but just to um, utilize the culture in a way that the people would like to see it utilized. Um, and that's what's most rewarding, I believe, in working in this field. Yes, I agree with Dan. Uh, community in our families and our um, tribal uh, clans and all of those things are very important to to the work that we do. Um, in order to develop, we develop these interventions. We can develop programs. We can bring in all these wonderful things. But if our families and our people don't want to use them, they're worthless. And so, you have to get engagement. You have to get uh, down to what it is our families and our people are asking for us, aren't asking what, what we can do to help them um, make it. And so part of our goal, you know, is self-determination, which is uh, the for families and people to make, be able to decide for themselves what they're needing or what they want. And so that's what we do. We, we really work and we've done focus groups. We've done town halls. Uh, we've done one-on-one -on -one interviews with, with uh, family members and our communities to really understand that we understand the size and scope of the problems going on in their community. We have a lot of different communities within our reservation and not one community represents all of them. Um, they all have their own different uh, and you know, unique challenges and they all have an idea how they want to address these challenges. And so our, our role and our duty to them is to understand that and to really pull from that. And so we've done this through, we've developed youth move groups. And so at our Sequoia High School, which is all Native American, um, we have developed a youth move program in that school. And this, they tell us uh, what they, how they want to address this. And we, we help them with support. We bring in trainings and teachings. Um, if they ask for, like, if we're gonna have a, um, an awareness day for mental health, they're the ones that are going to be leading that charge and telling us what to do within the schools. Um, they talk, they help the school influence with policies and how to directly help a student. And that's powerful. I mean, our youth are our future. And so to, in order to empower our youth, we got to listen to them first. So that's um, one of our big tenets is 
and how we move forward with our programs. Thank you for sharing that. I completely agree um, on the need for community engagement and and really um, doing work on a grassroots level to understand what our communities um, are, are saying and their stories. Um, and also recognizing that our traditional cultural medicine and practices are capable of working through um, ways and paths and channels that mainstream Western medicine and society doesn't understand. Um, and speaking of our culture as medicine and recognizing that our medicine is for the whole person um, and community and even the larger world. So I was wondering if Dan could speak to how he integrates um, culturally centered healing and traditional practices into his um, work as a physician. Yes, in, in our work that we've done, um, um, we've, we integrate traditional practices in, in our interventions, including drum assisted recovery therapy for Native Americans. And a couple of my projects with Dr. Elizabeth D'Amico from Rank Corporation and her team, we, we really first um, have an initial idea of what could be um, a potentially uh, appropriate intervention, and we take it to the community. Well, let me back up first. First, we understand from the community what's missing. Then we think about how we could address the community's needs. Then we formally go to back to the community in, term, in, 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 in ways of focus groups, conduct focus groups, get their get the community's perspectives and advice, and then uh, formalize or, or, or um, make a, an a initial intervention format or build a, our initial intervention format. We then typically will provide or the intervention to the community for their for additional feedback on what and how they actually feel about the intervention um, in order for us to make any final adjustments. That, that's our typical approach in, in a nutshell, how we um, integrate culture in our treatments, but it really does start from um, understanding what they are seeking and also what they want to participate in. We, Many researchers and policymakers may believe they have the answers, but you know, as in native researchers, we understand that the community holds the answers. So um, you know, we seek you know what they're interested in learning about, what they're interested in participating in. We're not going to choose a traditional practice and say, here, let's everyone do this traditional practice when it's a, a practice that they may not feel is most appropriate for the for their community so um yeah so we go back and forth with the community typically through the whole process of, of um, building interventions programs that support our people's health and well-being are deeply connected to cultural preservation and re revitalization efforts. Um, for example, using our native languages strengthens our cultural teachings and reinforces practices that are connected to the land. Um, Julie, I was wondering what the role of cultural preservation is in your work and how do you use native languages, stories and cultural identity in your work and um, research paradigms? Mm -hmm. This is a good question, you know, and when people talk to me and ask me about culture, it's hard to separate it from myself. And so when they say, mm -hmm. um, what, what ways do you use culture? You know, like this question is a very, you know, very good question, but at times it's like, I don't know how to separate it out to tell you. Cause I, I'm just, I just in this way, it's how I was born and raised. And so I'm not really right. sure how, what that really looks like to an outsider. Cause I'm, I'm lucky enough to work for a tribe and we're all like, 
70 percent of our uh, ther therapists are tribal members of you know of Cherokee as well as other tribes. And so when we talk about this um, approach, what we do, we do this on many different levels. We do it at an individual level, in a community level, family level. So depending on what type of intervention we're working with, and we do it all, all levels, um, we work really hard to do that. So for instance, we had new um, psychologist students come in and one of them was from out of state. And so she had never worked with a, a tribal nation before and uh, had not worked with natives before. And so what we wanted to do with her is um, train her and give her some um, some lessons and training around the Cherokee culture in particular. So we invited our, um, our executive director of our language programs at Cherokee Nation. We actually have a whole entire service group um, unit that is nothing but language preservation. And so we brought him in and had him do a class. There were four um, psychology residents and students in this class. And so he was able to talk about language and it just really, they were just blown away because the language of the Cherokee people and of any tribe, honestly, um, has been around. It's been around a long time. Even if you don't speak your language, it, infect, it, it in, impacted you because it, it's the language of your ancestors, of your parents, your grandparents, and that imp impacts how you think. Um, the concepts for Cherokee people, uh, you know, sometimes they don't translate to English. And so how you are and how you behave and how you believe is been impacted by that. And so for instance, an example was in the Cherokee language, there is no word for anxiety and depression doesn't translate like it does in English, how we understand depression. Instead, it's a concept that comes from your heart, not your head. And so Cherokees have believed for a long time with depression wasn't a state of mind, it was a state of heart. And so whenever you become depressed, uh, they, the elders and, the, and you go to an elder, you go to um, someone in your tribe, you talk about your feelings and how you felt, they would have you go outward. They felt like you were going inward too much. And so if you would go outward and you think about others beside yourself, um, that's going to be healing for you, you know, taking care of the elders around your community, taking care of people um, that are a part of your community is going to help kill you. And that's one, one example of how that works. And so our goal is to really integrate language um, in our assessments as well, um, we teach our therapists to, it's going to take longer to do assessments for Native Americans um, because of the, the different aspects that affects our Native American population. And so we do bring in um, different aspects of culture into our interventions too, with um, groups, mindfulness, that's a huge Cherokee concept that we've really integrated in, with a lot of our cultural activities like basket weaving and other things. We teach self-regulation through those skills. And also they're learning why we do what we do and, and why this has been passed down from our generations. And so just to give a few examples. Thank you for sharing your career paths, perspectives, and wisdom. Centralizing our communities, worldviews, languages, and stories is essential to action that creates space for healing and effective and sustainable systems. Your work is very inspiring and helps us better understand the many paths to supporting Native communities and health equity. Thank you, Sierra and Julie and Dan. That was great information and your work is really inspirational. Next, we're gonna hear from Dr. Melissa Walls about community approaches to addressing substance use disorders. Dr. Walls is the director of the Great Lakes Hub for the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health and Associate Professor of American Health in the Department of International Health. Dr. Walls is an indigenous social scientist who's committed to collaborative research with indigenous communities to promote health equity. Her work uses community-based participatory research to address mental health epidemiology culturally relevant family-based substance use prevention and mental health promotion programming and evaluation, and examining the impact of stress and mental health on diabetes. Dr. Walls is gonna share more about her journey from community involvement to professor and NIH-funded researcher. Buju everyone, my mingwan and dishnikaz, nagizi do a dam. Uh, my name is Melissa Walls, and I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University, and I direct the Great Lakes hub of our Center for American Indian Health. That sounds really fancy, I guess. It, it's a lot of titles and a lot of names, but I never imagined this would be where life would take me. And I just want to share a little bit about the journey I've been on to now be called a prevention scientist. I grew up in northern Minnesota, right on the Canadian border. I'm the daughter of an Anishinaabe or Ojibwe 
a woman. My mother is dual enrolled at the Boys Fort in Kuchiching First Nations bands of Ojibwe. And my dad is a German, Swedish, kind of Scandinavian, Minnesota mix. I was a first generation college student. I went to the community college in my little town. And when I went and moved to the University of Minnesota in, in Duluth, Minnesota, which is where I live now, um, my uncle told me about these uh, researchers who were collecting data about substance use in our communities. And he had gotten involved in that study sort of as a liaison to the university. So he lived on the reservation and, and he was sort of reporting back on how things were going. And my uncle really opened doors for me to learn about this thing called research. I didn't really understand it. What's going on? They're doing these surveys there. What are they doing with the surveys? Where are they going? And I was really fortunate to be mentored by him and by entire teams of community researchers across eight different Anishinaabe reservations and reserves as a young person. Um, at the same time, I was working for the Minnesota Chippewa tribe through youth programming with family members and really seeing how kids, including myself, would come alive when we would learn our language or we would get to engage in cultural activities. And little did I know that Fast forward 25 years, I would be leading those very studies um, in co deep collaboration with community partners and those same mentors who had helped me along the way. And what did the data tell us? They tell us that our culture and our community are the critical pathways to wellness for all of us. And so getting out there, engaging in our culture, talking to elders, listening to their stories, really celebrating the amazingness that it is to be indigenous how cool it is to be um, a member of your tribal community, of your urban Indian community. Celebrate those things, own those things, and who knows what doors will open. In my case, now as a researcher, I can share that I never understood that, you know, research is just a toolbox of things that helps us to speak to policymakers or to people in positions of power to advocate for our communities. And so I welcome any of you to reach out to me if you feel interested in this type of a career. It's allowed me to meet indigenous peoples all around the world and get to work with amazing students and other faculty members. And um, I just really celebrate all of you for joining today. Miigwech. The National Institute on Drug Abuse recently hosted the I Strengthen My Nation Challenge, where young people aged 14 to 25 submitted art and other artistic expressions of resilience to stand against substance misuse. Now we want to show you a video of the I Strengthen My Nation Challenge Awards. Then after that, we're going to hear from We Are Native, a comprehensive health resource for Native youth by Native youth. They strive to promote holistic health and positive growth in local communities and in the nation at large. We Are Native will give you ideas on how to get involved in activities to promote prevention in your own community. Hey, Uncle here. On behalf of We Are Native, I'd like to congratulate all the youth and youth groups across the country who submitted artwork, creative expressions, and community service project ideas for the first of its kind, NIDA Challenge. Your entries demonstrated the inherent resilience of our communities and the power of cultural practices to protect our communities against drug and alcohol misuse. You can check out all the submissions on We Are Native's art gallery for ideas and inspiration on things you can do to strengthen your nation. Each and every one of us can do our part in big and little ways every day. And this led birth to amazing applications and amazing submissions of art, um, group projects, and different ways to kind of address substance use in their communities. Hello, na Jenna Murray, me nani hot. Hi, my name is Jenna Murray. I am Eastern Shoshone. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, but my family is from the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, and my tribal headquarters are in Fort Washakie, Wyoming. I am the American Indian Alaska Native Fellow at NIDA, and I worked with Kathy Etz, and we are Native to put together this American Indian Alaska Native Youth Challenge Program. 
We had representation from at least 37 different tribes throughout North America, which was really amazing. And of all those submissions for the art project, we had 26 winners, 22 individual projects, and four group art projects. We loved the variety of projects that were submitted. We had charcoal paintings, acrylic paintings, interpretive dance and movement, traditional beadwork, and so much more. As far as the community project goes, we had five different winners, and I would like to personally acknowledge and congratulate each group for their awesome work. So first we have the Bluebird Youth Group, who proposed a really cool plan for a camping retreat and cultural immersion weekend. We had the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board Youth Delegates, who also proposed sort of a immersion weekend that was a boot camp to create public service announcements. Third, we had Abby Hilton, who proposed a program supported by a really well-researched paper um, describing the importance of peer support and, and really leaning on each other throughout recovery. I'd like to congratulate University of New Mexico undergraduate students. We had Alicia, Hannah, Shinoa, and Kira. They planned an incredible three-day program for high school and middle school students. Finally, we have Shadron Joseph, who proposed an indigenous bow making project to not only just pass on this really incredible tradition, but to allow participants to have a creative outlet, allowing them to become and stay resilient against drug use. I felt deeply connected to this challenge program because I am Indigenous myself and grew up in a community and family that suffers from substance use disorders. So I really felt a personal connection here and it was really incredibly inspiring moving forward. I think what this whole program really means to me is using your cultural connection, you're forming those meaningful connections with your community and leaning on each other through hard times. I'm Maya, I'm 14 and I'm marijuana free. My name is Anna, I'm 15 years old and I'm marijuana free. My culture, my choice. My culture, my choice. So I just wanted to share that I come from a long line of addiction in my family and I'm here to break that chain and be better than what I'm said to be because of my family. My grandma, some of my uncles and aunts live on the reservation. I think the native culture is very beautiful. We are reaching out to different coalitions and we also have, are planning on making more videos like this. Um, we also have a youth group that does a lot of like local community kind of things. We started making the video, we had talked about how many dispensaries have been getting put up on colonies, especially. And so coming from like a young kid who lives on the colony, like that's what we're around and that's what we want to say like to the kids, like just cause you're around it doesn't mean you have to do it. Our tribes are trying to help youth become drug free and have a new transition into life. I love like my, what we do and like protecting like kids from like, <laughs> marijuana use or any just drug abuse. So I think it's really cool to like get a video out there showing that they don't have to just do that, they can do anything. Even if something's going on and it's hard, go on, do what you love, like sports, musicals, art, do whatever you can to occupy yourself and make you happy and choose the right choice. My culture, my choice. Hi, my name is Sierra Bufflehead. I am part of the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, and I am also part of the Omaha tribe. With most of my family being out of Omaha, it's mostly just me, my aunt, my brother, phones, Facebook, texting. That's all how we uh, stay connected, how we keep in touch. So I took the night um, landscape and thought of a filter a filter people use to make um, themselves look better, make themselves feel better about themselves. And so if you have a landscape in your life or a dark patch in your life, people would use filters to make it seem brighter, make them feel happier. And so I thought, think of the phone as a brighter future. Yat Caitlin Biggie Yinishia. 
Hello, my name is Caitlin Begee. I come from the Navajo Nation. I hope that my art is able to make people want to learn more about their culture and more about their identity and where they come from because like a lot of my people are like heavy drinkers and like they're really into drugs. So I thought that I should capture something beautiful that maybe they can see within themselves. And my inspiration was like my identity and like what I find beautiful within my culture and my identity. So I included a portrait of myself and a figure of a woman and the Neh woman and the Navajo wedding basket, which represents like the pattern of life. Aho ego tia. So you can do it all. It's all up to you. My name is Kathy Etz and I'm the director of the American Indian Alaska Native Program at NIDA. So excited to be here today to congratulate the winners. Over the years, as we've supported research on drug addiction among American Indian and Alaska Native people, we've learned a lot about risk factors, but we've also learned about the incredible strength and resiliency contained within Indigenous culture and the amazing ideas that youth have for staying healthy and protecting their communities. This challenge competition was an opportunity to showcase and celebrate that strength and also have youth directly share their ideas about resilience to drug abuse so that we could share those ideas with the world. The judges were absolutely wowed by the art and the ideas that youth had to stop drug abuse in their communities. These ideas can be leveraged to strengthen all Indigenous nations. Hello everyone, I'm Nora Volkov. I direct the National Institute on Drug Abuse and uh, I'm very proud to be here with all of you to grat congratulate the winners of a challenge that actually takes advantage of the richness of the American Indian and Alaska Native culture and their involvement in the well-being of each other and to use art as a means of communicating our experiences and in the process, being able to help others. Thanks very much for this opportunity and I congratulate the individual winners and the group winners. I'd like to thank Jenna for the creativity, passion and commitment she brought to implementing these challenges. I'd also like to thank all of the people who submitted entries to these challenges. I'd like to acknowledge your creativity, strength, and passion for enhancing your communities. It is clear that you will all make a lasting impact on your families, communities, and continue to strengthen your nation. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Thomas Lee Ghostog Jr. I am Burns Paiute as well as Oglala Lakota, and I am the We Are Native Project Coordinator here at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, which is located in beautiful Portland, Oregon. Um, and I just want to take this time to share a little bit about our partnership with NIDA or the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the contest that we were able to put on throughout the late fall and summertime of, of this year. We were super excited to uh, have this partnership with NIDA because it was something that a lot of youth and young adults feel strongly about in their own communities, which is drug misuse. Um, so with that, we had a contest or an I Strength in My Nation contest where we asked youth and young adults to visually show us what it means to, to have prevention of drug and alcohol misuse in their own communities or within their own lives. And so we did, we put out a call for artwork and I will be the first to tell you that the artwork that was submitted was a beyond amazing. And we knew that within this contest, we couldn't keep this artwork to ourselves. So what we did is we wanted to highlight the positive things that youth are doing in their own communities. And we wanted to do that through our website. So at this time, I want to take, uh, I would like to take on a, you on a virtual tour 
to see how you can see that artwork through our We Are Native website. So join in me. So hopefully you see my screen right now. Um, if you haven't, if you can't see it, if you want to go to wearenative.org, um, you'll see our really awesome homepage. If you hover over the My Impact section, where you can see it turn yellow, um, if you go down to the I Strength in My Nation gallery and click on it, the first thing you'll see is an overview video and the announcement of our contest winners. And shout out to Jenna. Jenna was a, a huge piece in helping this contest and helping us put on this contest. So um, wherever she's at, uh, Jenna, we appreciate you so much. But if you scroll down, you have an opportunity to see all of the contest entries. Um, and what I really like is that it has an image of what they submitted, but it also has a blurb about the artwork that they submitted and how it relates to them and how they use this artwork to really help their communities to become and help with drug misuse. So I can scroll all day and show you, but the biggest and the most you know, exciting part that I wanna share is, is having you at home scroll through, take your time, read the entries and really see the power and the knowledge that these youth have and the passion that they have of eliminating drug misuse in their own communities. Another piece that I really want to share on our website is resources for youth and young adults out there. If you're on this webinar, um, a section of our website that can be helpful navigating um, these types of situations, especially if you have friends, relatives, uncles, aunts that might be in this situation where you see them uh, misusing drugs or alcohol. So if you go again, hover over to the My Mind section this time, you'll see a, a, a lot of categories and articles that we have within our website. But the, the one I really wanna highlight right here is the must, substance misuse. So this is the landing page or the homepage of substance misuse. And you can have an overview right here where I'm gonna highlight right there. But also what I really like is there's articles that have different topics relating to drug misuse and alcohol misuse. So as you can see um, in this one, how to make peace with your body. So it's really about accepting who you are as a person that can help you um, along the road. Also, we have articles about substance misuse, the Red Ribbon Week, which is, which is a drug and alcohol prevention week that schools hold throughout um, the U.S., but also we have different videos from that same contest and, and their artwork submissions. If you click on load more articles, you'll see a, a bunch more articles that have, you know, different topics ranging from recovering addicts on, re on how rehab has improved their lives to worried about someone's alcohol use. Again, this could be your cousin, your relative, your aunties, or even just friends. Um, and if you load more content, you can have different articles and see and read for yourself and, and go through these. So I just wanna really thank you again. And please, 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 if you have time, look at the contest entries or um, young adults, youth out there, scroll through this section. You might, sign, you might find something useful, um, but again, I just wanna thank everyone and thank you, Nida. And I hope you all are blessed. Have a good day. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you're inspired to do what you can to prevent problems in your own communities like substance use disorders and others. You know, there are many pathways to get into a career in prevention science. My pathway began as a first generation college student who didn't even start college until age 22. My degree was in criminal justice, law enforcement, and my job was in child welfare. After doing that for a few years, I went back to school to get my master of social work degree. It was after that that I joined with some prevention scientists and other colleagues to test interventions to reduce underage alcohol use and associated problems in rural Northeastern Oklahoma, where I come from. That work was helpful as I joined the faculty of the University of Oklahoma and started the Center for Tribal Social Work. Through that center, we recruit tribal members to earn their degrees, undergraduate or graduate, and we support those students in every way we can. So hopefully after they graduate, they can return to their communities to help their neighbors and friends and family members and others continue toward the path of healing and health. Thanks also to the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute on Drug Abuse and our friends and collaborators who helped put this video together. As we say in the Cherokee language, until we see each other again, Donatangahain.